I want to thank you for allowing me to come. You're really a joyful people, and Edmonton needs you, and God has put you here. It's Christ who adds to the church. He already, if you think about it, when God was forming Pangaea, the earth, out of the sea during creation, he knew that that would be the same ground that his son would walk into Jerusalem on. When he formed a donkey for the first time, he knew his son would be riding on the back of a donkey, a descendant of that creature, to be crucified. He knew in Genesis 2 verse 7 when God breathed the breath of life into Adam and he became a living soul. He knew that the descendants of this creation would murder his son on a cross. And yet he still allowed it to happen. He knew what your ministerial passion was before you ever became a Christian. We had a study last night on the book of Esther, chapter 414. Who can say you've been put in the palace for such a time as this? The you is you. And Edmonton is your palace. And now's the time. You're responsible to pursue what God has put before you. So far in this series, now there's some of you that this is the first time that you've been here for the series, and you're going to be saying, oh, I missed quite a bit. You did. You missed a lot. And uh, I brought some books for you that if you, this is, uh, how many here have started reading your books at all? Okay, does it follow what, the, the, what we've been covering? This is for people who on Sunday, who didn't come Friday and Saturday and wish they would have now, but maybe their schedule didn't allow them to, you'll get caught up. This is like an entire seminar with a lot of stuff that we didn't even cover. Uh, there's over 70 stories in it, over 500 Bible verses, and this is the only book in the Brotherhood that even deals with the second highest biotic principle of a growing church. Who benefits the most? Who will benefit the most? And by the way, if you, if you want a book, there's six more back here. There are 12 Canadian. You can get them on Amazon as well if you wish, but they charge you a lot more. I think it's like $23.99 on Canadian Amazon or Amazon.ca. If you would need a book, there's some back there. A lot of you have it already, but your preacher is going to benefit greatly. From this. The reason why is Nehemiah 4 6. The people had a mind to work. The average congregation, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. But what would happen? There was a rich, he would be equivalent to a billionaire today. And this man back in the Depression era, he said, I would rather have 1% of 100 men than 100% of one man any day. And he was asked, why, why would this be true? He says, all I have to do is have them give 2% and then I have twice as much being done. And then there's that much less I have to do. The average congregation, once they go down the path of 1 Peter 4, verse 10 and 11, employing their gifts for the manifold uh, service of God, once they do that, I've seen congregations go from, let's look, at, let's look at the Broad Top, Pennsylvania. I went up to their congregation on Wednesday nights for a quarter, drove two hours one way, and uh, they had six people. That's all they had, a little coal mining town. In fact, they used to be the Coal Mount Church of Christ, but then the coal mine closed and then they their building got wiped out with a flood, and so then they decided to get a different building. They're on the verge of getting a preacher now. But they've grown because they understand who they are. And you can't be excellent. I can't be excellent if I try to be somebody I'm not. Can't do it. I'll run out of passion. If you want a book, just let me know. There's some back there. We're now going to get into, oh, I got to turn this on. 
We're now going to get into the last two sessions. Sunday morning class, we're going to look at the two biggest categories of the ten ministerial passions. That's the gift of mercy and the gift of service. The gift of mercy and the gift of service. In Romans 12 verse 8, in the gift of mercy, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Romans 12, 6 said, And since we have gifts that differ according to the uh, grace given unto us, let each exercise them accordingly. And when you're a mercy giver, 17% out of 10,000 people tested, 17% come out number one in mercy giver. In mercy giver. The word for mercy, like Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, Elios. Merciful. It's the ability to stand in somebody else's shoes and feel how they feel. This is like one of my lowest scores by far. I show mercy, but I don't, it's just not, doesn't, doesn't help me much. Doesn't. A lot of times, <laughs> oh, you're going to think, he's a horrible man. That's what you're going to think. He's a horrible person. Why did he come here? You know, sometimes I'm not, I'm not super high in encouragement either. You say, well, I've been encouraged. Well, that's because you've been educated. That's where I like to do. But a lot of times, if you ask anybody I've ever, um, any congregation I've been at, it's a common thing. When somebody wants to give a hug, I'll hug them, and I'll pat them on the back and say, there you go, get it out. This is for you. <laughs> uh, my first sermon that I preached down at sunset was this. Stop hugging me. Just stop hugging me. Because it's like, you know, I didn't like it. I don't need mercy. I, I'm okay. <laughs> but then I realized it's not for me. It's for them. It's not, it's not for me. It's for them. And are we supposed to encourage one another, support one another, serve one another, love one another? Absolutely. So, so a lot of times we've got to get outside of our comfort zone. But we're talking about your comfort zone. When you pursue a mercy giver, one who shows compassion. They want to stand in somebody else's shoes. Fill what they fill. Understand what they have. A good example of that is Mark chapter 10, verse 46 and 47. There was a blind man named Bartimaeus. And this blind man, Bartimaeus, he couldn't see, but he heard all that Jesus was doing. Large crowds around him. And he can't see. And what does he cry out? Jesus, Son of God, have Elios on me. Come stand in my shoes. Feel what it feels like to be blind and to be moved to do something about it. And the man ended up seeing. The mercy giver, the mercy giver is the most compassionate of all. And if you're high in encourager and mercy giver, Oh boy, you're just, a, you're just like a gigantic hug waiting to help people. That's what you are. The mercy giver is given the ability to understand the suffering of others. To gain a better understanding of the characteristics of the mercy giver, let's look at some in the Bible. You remember Tabitha? Tabitha in Acts chapter 9, 36 through 39. All the widows, as, as, as uh, the widows were grieving and they were showing... Dorcas would be the other name, the Greek name. They would hold up the garments, the tunics that she used to make for these widows. She cared. She really cared. And blessed be God, he raised her up from the dead. The Philippian jailer. Wait a second, a jailer, a mercy giver? Yeah. Notice what happened. In Acts chapter 16, 22 through 24, Paul and Silas are singing, giving praise to God about midnight. You know, everybody's kind of dozing off. And an earthquake happens, the door's fling open. The Philippian jailer, he thinks everybody escaped. The punishment, if you were the jailer and people escaped, is death. So he figured, I'll just fall on my sword. And Paul said, no, wait, we're all here. And then they presented the man, the gospel, the Philippian jailer. But what was the Philippian jailer doing at the time he received the gospel presentation? What was he doing? 
He was cleaning the wounds on Paul and Silas's back. The presentation went more like this. Oh, and then Jesus, he was just, ooh, that high dying is hot. He felt he needed to alleviate someone's suffering. That's what his passion was. And the result was that the jailer and his whole household were baptized. See, God had to get a prison ministry started. But Paul, who knows, knows that he works out all things to give those who love him, in order to get a prison ministry, you have to go to prison. And so he did. I've seen that prison cell before. It's really humbling to see where Paul and Silas were laying on their backs. But it's absolutely blessed knowing that there was a man in charge of that prison who really, deep down inside, wanted to alleviate suffering of people. The Samaritan woman, she was a mercy giver. In chapter 10 uh, of Luke 25 through 37, if you open up to that, I want you to see this. The Samaritan, open your Bibles up to this. We're going to have a little fun with this. You really want to understand? Now, the average is 17% of you will test number one in this category. So if you turn to Luke chapter 10, hang on a second. Luke chapter 10, let's take some turn and read this. Start reading, well, I'll paraphrase it because I got to be done at a quarter till. That's not metric though, so I'll have to. Okay. Verse 25, and a lawyer stood up and put him to test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said, What is it written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, with all your mind. Love your neighbors yourself. Jesus said, You've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. But wishing to justify himself, he said, Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And then he tells a parable of a good Samaritan. Jesus replied, a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. That was like banded highway. It has a bunch of rock crevices. There's always bandits around. And you would get camel jacked there oftentimes if you're carrying your supplies. That's why when it says the three wise men came and presented gold, frankincense, and myrrh, there's not three wise men. That'd be three stupid men. It was a whole posse. Probably had swords. When they came in carrying that cargo, well, why is it three wise men? Because you think one carried gold, one carried frankincense, one carried myrrh. No, they carried a big truckload of it. And they came to honor Jesus as a king. And they would have been the three stupid men had they traveled this road as they came into Jerusalem. If you were to get a newspaper from the first century, the Jerusalem Times, if they had that, It'd be a common writing that the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, it'd be just a, ma a matter of the amount of camel jackings that went on at that time. And so, notice it says, and this man was riding along, he was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, he just made a bunch of trades, probably has a bunch of supplies, he's headed out, has all kinds of stuff, and he fell among robbers. And they stripped him and beat him and, le and went away leaving him half dead. Now you encouragers are saying, well, at least he's half alive. That's not the point. Okay? I know what you were thinking. You were thinking, well, he's still got half his life. No, he's half dead. <laughs> Who's right? Yeah. Left him half dead. Now, listen to what Jesus said. He said, by chance a priest. Here's a man stripped naked. He has nothing. His cell phone taking everything. He's just alongside the road. And a priest comes by. I'm sure that man's saying, Lord, help me, help me, help me. Oh, hallelujah, here comes a priest. That's representative of God's mercy, right? What does that priest do? He goes up. Now, when I've been in Africa on numerous times, when you're out in the bush and somebody's laying alongside the road, First time I saw that, Augustine Tawaya said, I said, hey, stop, they need help. He said, no, 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 and he sped up and went by. Because it's common to fake like you're hurt, and then you get out, and then you're the one walking and laying alongside the road, and they got your car. So this priest, give him some slack. 
he saw the man who needed mercy and he hurried up and just moved on by and the man is saying to himself oh no God mercy I need mercy Lord somebody to come help alleviate my suffering then a Levite the tribe for which the law was vested in the administrative arm of the law hallelujah God thank you so much thank you Jesus thank you hallelujah but the Levite whoo well, just keep moving on don't just keep moving on two people symbolic of God's kingdom under the Old Testament they didn't have any mercy. But then listen to this. But a Samaritan. The name Samaritan sounds kind of cool today, doesn't it? I am a Samaritan. Well, let's take it back to the first century equivalent. <coughs> Substitute something that, so we can capture it. A certain pedophile. Oh, oh, what do you mean? Because the Jews hated Samaritans. They were the second-class citizen half-breed with the Assyrian cousins. Who they were the first ones to be carried away in 722 BC with hooks in their noses. You see, if you were to look, the Jews hated the Samaritans so much. Remember the woman at the well? The apostles showed disdain toward her. The woman said, you being a Jew, speak to me. Because she was an outcast. She was an outcast among outcasts. And Jesus still reached out to her. It was so bad that if the Sea of Galilee were right here, Samaria would be here, and then you have Jerusalem with Judea. And what the Jews would do, they hated them so much, Jesus just marched right through to go to his hometown. That was a, that was a bad neighborhood to be in. What the North Jews normally did was take an extra day of walking, go up, get on the other side, of the river, walk up until they got to Galilee and then go over. They'd rather walk a whole extra day than come into contact with a Samaritan. So when Jesus says a certain Samaritan, that's not a compliment. This is a bad thing. And these self-righteous Jews, like the priest and the Levite, who are symbolic of the mercy, well they just stepped aside. But a certain Samaritan who was on a journey that word is a business word. He just wasn't out for a lackadaisical walk. He probably had his Apple computer, his iPhone, sending text messages. He had business to do. But guess what happened? When he came upon him, he saw him. Underline this in your Bible. He felt compassion. Felt compassion. You ever almost get into a car wreck, but then you don't, but your heart doesn't know that you almost didn't get into a car wreck. It thinks that you did, and it goes boom, 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 like that. That's what the word encompasses here. He felt compassion. When a mercy giver, somebody with this real passion of mercy, had that, they see someone suffering. When they see the commercial on TV with the dog with the mat in his eyes and, and some singer singing, when the arms of the angel, they go, <laughs> and they're crying. I'm thinking, you know, poor dog needs to be put down. But they feel that compassion. Felt that compassion. And they were moved into action. He came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and he brought him to the end to take care of him. And he put his money where his mouth was. On the next day he took out two denarii which would be equivalent to two days wages and gave them to the innkeeper and says you take care of him and whatever you spend on him when I return I'm gonna be back I'm gonna pick up the tab you think the guy was able to stand in his shoes even though he had no shoes which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers hands and he said the one who showed Elios mercy to him and he said go and do likewise that's the passion of mercy. Here's, some, here's the signs of maturity. If you're a mature individual and you're a mercy giver, your attitude, you have, you have a very positive attitude. You're forgiving in relationships. You're content in character. You're gentle in spirit. By the way, um, we have a comedian down south. If you say you're lying through your tooth, you might be a redneck. Well, I got my own version of Jeff Foxworthy. Okay. If you are in the medical field, 
like a nurse or a CNA, because you like to take care of people, you might be a mercy giver. If you bring home a dog whose right eye was clawed out by a cat, whose left ear was bitten off by another dog, whose tail was broken off in a door and his left back leg is missing from when it was run over by a car, and he answers to the name of Lucky, you might be a mercy giver. I had one of these in my family. I hit a hawk. This hawk was like, had ADD or something. He was just flying. I was going down by Lubbock, and speed limit in Lubbock is like a 70, 80 miles an hour down there. I see this hawk just flying. He's like looking, is that a rattlesnake over there? And he flew down, went right into the grill of my van. All the kids were in there. This thing was like, help me! He was like broken up big time. My daughter, who's high in mercy, gave her. She said, Dad, we can take him home. We can mend him. I said, I don't even know where to start. I'm not touching him. I got a stick and I pried him off my grill. We almost hit an emu that day too. Some farmer's emus got out. That would have been a bigger mess. But see, you have your tells. They're magnets, uh, they're forgiving in relationships, they're content with character. And they're gentle in spirit. They have a heart for others. They're magnets for the wounded. They're ma if you hear this saying, I don't know where you find these people from, you might be a mercy giver. Yeah, you're laughing because you might be, because you know what it is. They're listeners for the neglected. They're faithful in relationships. They're attentive. They reach out to the poor. They reach out to the ill. They reach out to the aged. You know, most of your nurses that you have in that medical profession are encourager or mercy giver or both. Those nurses that you don't want when you go into the hospital that has that drill sergeant look on their face, and they only give ice sponge baths on the coldest day of the year, they're not a mercy giver. That's probably a prophet. You know, um, I appreciate what I'm not. I don't know how, how people can show so much mercy. But my heart isn't near as much into it. But I do. I do. I'm more like Brother Wharton. You got to confront people when they're wrong, right? You ever see the Geico commercial where they talk about the drill sergeant who's a counselor? Yeah, you know, go Google it. You'll like it. Has that guy who was in a lot of movies who was a drill sergeant? And uh, <laughs> he says, uh, You can't believe you could save this much on car insurance? Do you not believe that a drill sergeant would make a good counselor? There's this guy on the couch and he's saying, I just don't know, I'm, I'm really struggling with my feelings. And he has a box of Kleenex. He takes the box of Kleenex and he bounces it off his head. He said, you jack wagon, get up and be strong. <laughs> oh boy. I was going to take something for counseling, you know, because it seems like ministers, oh, I'm going to get a, a PhD in counseling. I looked into it. I did my research. I couldn't sit there listening to half of that. I couldn't do that. If you want mercy, you don't come to me. We were in India one year. I had a chiropractor and his two twin daughters with us. And they were mercy givers. Mercy givers and encouragers. And we went to the exchange in Kakanada to exchange American for uh, rupee. It was like 44 to 1 at that time. So you walk in with a little stack of money and you come out and you're like the Monopoly man. <laughs> and outside of that place is a bunch of beggars. But they're not ordinary beggars. They're orchestrated beggars. It's moms. They take the little babies and they rub dirt all over their face. And then they hold their baby and they have a little coin in their hand. They don't speak English. I don't speak their language either. But they go, when you come out, uh, uh, point to the baby's mouth, point to their mouth, point to money, and go like that. Now we know what they want, but I'm dumb. 
But I, I told the twins, I said, we're going to go in there. You need to walk out and follow me because we have money for like 50 preachers and their families. And they're going to hit you up. You could be saying, I got a hip. Don't do that. Don't do it. I will walk out, Nehemiah will come out, and we will walk quickly. Do not make eye contact. <laughs> okay, okay. And they came out with their little stack of money in their bag. As they're walking out, I get in the car, we're ready to go. I said, where's the twins? They were surrounded. They were, now, I carved a way for them. I said, just follow my lead. I'll get them distracted. This is what a not mercy giver does. So as they have their little coin in their hand, they go, ah, ah. And they're dirty, they're rubbing dirt on their child, exploiting their child to make money. Eh, eh. So I walk up to them. I say, oh, I don't speak your language, but you're willing to take money from your child's diet and give to me because you want to honor me as being a guest in your country. Thank you. And I take their coins and I took like 15 coins and they're going, oh, Ah, ah, ah. And then I gave all the coins to one person. I walked up and said, oh, your child looks extra hungry. I don't need this. Boom. And I put the big pile of coins in her hand. And then like a bunch of sows chewing up on a grain sack. So I had a way. It was like, make a run for it. Boom. I got to the vehicle. But the twins, they weren't there. They got caught up in the melee. And they were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, take money, money, money. They gave away like $500 there. And I told them, I said, listen, you just gave away to charlatans exploiting children, like chess pieces. And you took money that was designated for 10 preacher families to live on for a month. Was God using their gift at that time? No. You see, the mercy is good. Mercy is great. But don't abuse it. Here's some signs of immaturity. If you're immature and you have this passion, watch out. Because they can be very, very indecisive. They're often inconsistent in reactions, neglectful in corrections and doormats in relationships. They are. If you have been beaten by your man and you keep forgiving him, you might be a mercy giver. I can tell you I've never met an abused woman who was a flaming prophet. Never met that. You wouldn't get by with that. First time you slap, it's like, you need to go to sleep. I know where thou dwellest. <laughs> That's King James Version, of course. Have you heard of dwellest? Okay. 16, 11. It's one of those things. But there was a lady I knew. She was a nurse, extremely high in mercy giver. That was her highest one. She loved her job. She loved alleviating suffering. Her husband was a horrible person, not a Christian. And they ended up separating. She moved to Dallas. He would beat her all the time. It started out as yelling at her and then one night he slapped crossed another line pretty soon he was choking her and stuff so she moved out for her own safety four months later the doorbell rang she opened the door and the next thing she wakes up in the hospital and he wakes up in jail he drove 14 hours just to go beat her up we don't want to enable evil if you're, if you're immature and you have this passion that you want to go deworm orphans in Somalia, then make sure that you do it for God's glory. Not just base things on your feelings. They're the most feeling of all people. When you hear people say, well, I just feel... You might be an encourager, you might be a mercy giver. Here's another thing. They're emotional. They're very, very emotional. They're prone to depression, prone to sorrow, prone to oversensitivity. Um, why are they prone to depression? Because mercy givers are magnets for pitiful people. And let me tell you, there's some very sad stories out there. And if you end up, your life is dedicated to collecting things that are very, very sad, it can start to rub off on you. By the way, the people with the highest rate of depression, encouragers, mercy givers. 
because they get really close. They have a hard time getting away because they might leave, but their heart is still in it. Also, they lack uh, perspective. They tend to be uninformed, disorganized, undisciplined. I know a lady named Lisa. She lived across the street from us in Osceola. She found out she was pregnant with her second child and that her husband was leaving her on a 12-hour period. She was devastated. She had to go to a psychiatric ward and she was driving 30 miles north to be a CNA at a nursing home in Iowa. And 30 miles in the dead of winter, you know what that can be. That's hard. So a bunch of us guys at church, we had a big packing house, a meat processing plant in town. They were going to pay twice as much. We knew some of the managers. They were members of our congregation. We pulled our ignorance together and we said, let's get her a job there. Let's get her a job. She'll only have to drive one mile. We can help her. She'll make twice as much. Get benefits. Get all those things. They arranged an interview. She went into an interview. And when I went back over, I knew she had the job. I said, well, uh, how'd it go? She said, oh, they offered me the job. I said, congratulations. She said, I turned them down. What? I was hurt. There was a lot of work that went into that. Yeah. And she took the spiritual gift in this test. She got 16 out of 16. And I realized our grievous error. I went back over to her. You see, you can't show mercy to a 10-pound chuck roast. You can't. You can only show it to people. And I went over and I apologized to her. I said, you know, according to this, you absolutely love your job that you have now. She started crying. She said, if I don't have somewhere to go to exercise godliness by showing mercy to people, you might as well lock me up in the insane asylum and I'll never get out. I'll be no good to anybody. So we switched plans. We made it to where if it was going to be snowing or anything like that, we'd have somebody give her a ride. We helped her get a four-wheel drive vehicle. We had people help watch her kids. You know what was happening though? You like people that you like. If she's a flaming mercy giver, she's working with a bunch of mercy givers. You know what started happening? From Indianola, a bunch of nurses that she started working with who saw that we could stand in her shoes and fill what she fills, they started coming to church down in Osceola and converting. From that one woman who went through a horrible time, we had 10 baptisms. How are you going to reach mercy givers if you don't empower mercy givers? How are you going to get food away at a food bank if you don't empower that? Let's go to this real quick. Here's some things that you can do. If you're a mercy giver, seek out and comfort the lonely and forgotten in the congregation. And I guarantee you, wherever there's humans, there's forgotten people. Oh, nobody's a better counselor than you. Start a ministry to help battered women and children. You can take a foreign mission trip to a poor country. You know, when I go to Greece, they have an, uh, um, an Islamic ministry for the Afghan woman, women. And I took this lady named Drew, who was a flaming mercy giver. She always wanted to go to Africa to do missions, but she had had reoccurring cancer over and over again. But she's not high in teaching, not high in evangelism, but you know what she did? She went with us, and there she helped prepare meals and helped teach Afghan women, whose entire family was wiped out in Afghanistan how to read for the first time. I got a picture of a 37-year-old woman. She was a mother of two, her husband, and, and she only had two kids, but all her family was gone. She showed up in Greece, could not speak Greek, could not speak American. She was learning to read, and I was there the day. I got a picture of it. Her name is Zarifa. Drew taught her how to write her name for the first time in her life. That's a mercy giver. She had so great a fun. There's a story about Drew in there before the trip to Greece. Start a letter writing minute. No, no, careful. A letter writing ministry to prisoners. Don't go see them unless if you bring a prophet. Because I know what's going to happen. You're going to get in there and you're going to be saying, Yeah, I know. I read about you, Mr. Manson. Helter skelter. La, 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 la. I want to get married. 
You just, I mean, that's not a good environment. Bring a prophet with you. Protect you. Don't marry a triple murderer. Because you will. If you're immature and you go in there and you think, well, I'm strong. You're going to get in there and your heart's going to say, oh, oh, he's human. He's human. He can be rehabilitated. You know, if you date and or marry a project, you might be a mercy giver. <laughs> okay? Don't think you can fix somebody. You can't. You can only fix yourself with the power of Christ. Spend time helping terminally ill patients. Most of you hospice workers who go hold the hands of dying people, they're so good at it because they're mercy givers. They can do that. Make visits to nursing homes, hospitals, that's a lonely place. Volunteer at a pregnancy center for troubled teens. Let's get to the gift of service real quick. Service. Service. Romans 12, 7 says, If service in is serving. 1 Peter 4, verse 10, 11. Whoever serves, let him do so as by the strength with God supplies. The servant is basically a maintenance people for people. 22% largest group, and there's a lot of them here. You just like to help people. That's how you are. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on that. You can get more out of the book. But what I want you to see is turn to Luke chapter 10 again, verse 38 through 42. You want to see what the passion of service is? There's a lesson to learn right here. 38 through 42. Luke chapter 10. <clears throat> now they were traveling along. He entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed her into her home. She's a flaming servant, by the way. That's what servants do. Oh, come over to my house. I got a ministry tool God blessed me with. And she had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet. Jesus shows up to your small home group Bible study. Mary's sitting at, or, or, or Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus. She probably has a persuasion of that of teaching. She's going to glean the real food. But what was Martha doing? The little flaming servant. Read about it. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. She came to him saying, now this is, this is what we do with our spiritual gifts. We want to try to impose our gift on somebody else. Lord, now she interrupts Jesus' Bible study. Do you not care my sister's left me to do all the serving alone? She's in making hot wings and nachos. That's what she's doing. Oh, we've got to get her ready. Servant, servant, servant. What are you doing, Mary? You're sitting at the feet. He says, tell her to help me. <laughs> and what did Jesus say? Martha, Martha. See, it doesn't read like this. Martha, Martha. No. When you double down on something, the emphasis is going on the second one. And what he's saying is, Martha, Martha. You're so worried about so many things. Your sister chose the good thing because it was good for her. How many times has God said to us, I'm going to pick on you some more. I know you got thick skin of a water buffalo. because <laughs> That's the nature of it. I do too. How many times have you maybe tried to impose your gift on somebody? You need to feel about this like the exact same way. Yeah. And then Jesus says, Wharton, Wharton. Damien, Damien. Right, right. Don't try to impose your gift on somebody else. That's what she was trying to do. Don't make that mistake. Who was right? Mary or Martha? Yes. They're both right. You have to feel the same way I do about this. No, I don't. I don't have to. Because you're assaulting God at that point. Because we're made in the likeness and image of God. He has the patent on us. He knows what it's about. Who are you to question the Creator? on how he made. Let's look at some areas where we can signs uh, they're creative. They're very creative. They usually work well with their hands. They're resourceful in their means. They're usually good at meeting needs. One congregation I was at, they were 47 percent servant. They ended up starting a widow's and a single parent house ministry where they would go get a bunch of these maintenance guys who love working with their hands and they would help them redo their house they need a roof done they need a faucet something 
they had so much joy. But guess what? That ministry's still in place because they have a lot of people who love doing it. Isn't it important to love your ministry? Yeah. Well, you're going to love your ministry if you design it around you, not you around it. They're incredibly spiritual. They pray more than anybody else. They generally fellowship more. They more patient like Anna, who, listen to what it said, Aunt, uh, Anna, Luke 22, 36 to 38, she was a faithful servant of God who never left the temple serving day and night with fasting and prayers. They have a strong work ethic. They're thorough in their efforts. They're involved in anonymity and they're pleasant in their service. It is a, my youngest son, extremely administrative. Oh, he, you know, when he would sit down as a child, he didn't want one food touching his other food. He hated it when his peas rolled over into like his chicken. He, he'd like, it was like he was outlining his plate. So I knew he was high in administration, but not only that, He's high in encouragement. He loves laughing and smiling. But the other thing too is, he's extremely high in service. I remember there was a sister in Christ, came up to me after church one time. She said, you know what your son did? I thought, oh no, what did my son do? She was a prophet, by the way, Mildred. She would say something, say something, say something. But it wasn't a negative thing. She was also high in servant. She said, there's somebody who spilled some water by the water fountain and he walked out of class and I was just watching. And he walked by that water and he went and grabbed a paper towel and wiped it up. Nobody told him. He just wanted to do it because he wanted to help other people. I was proud of him. Today, when he was in ninth grade, I went to, my, uh, to him. I said, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? Let's start planning it. And no, serious. He said, Dad, he said, you know, he's administrative, so he got very good grades. Academic All-American. But also, he loves the smile. Remember the encourager? Cheeks hurt. He loves to smile all the time. But he's a servant. He wants to work with his hands. At age 15, he said, Dad, I want to be a dentist. I want to be a dentist. So why do you want to be a dentist? He said, because I'll work on smiles. I know there's going to be a lot of study, and I get to work with my hands. If you go to Destin, Florida, in May, he graduated University of Pennsylvania, an Ivy League school in dentistry. His scholarship was $980,000. They paid him to go to school. And he loves it. He's not going to be like dentists of the past that they're depressed and everything because they don't consider me a real doctor. That's not true. He's a maintenance person for smiles. That's what he does, and he loves it. He's married to one of our deacon's daughters, and now he's teaching Bible class in there. They also have signs of immaturity. They often fatigue. They tend not to be able to say no. If you can't say no when somebody says, hey, can you help me move and clean out, uh, uh, do, you know, clean out the attic of brown recluse spiders? Oh, okay then you might be a servant. If you're an immature servant, you can't say, no, I don't, they get taken advantage of that. Well, let's get him. He'll do anything. Also, uh, they tend to take on too much, take on impossible tasks. They're led by their emotions. They tend to be over-talkative. They tend to be depressed if they're immature, and they tend to be too subjective. Remember, they're in the subjective category. They have, per they have, personal they have personality struggles. They tend to micromanage others. If you would rather go do all the stuff you wanted your kid to do because you didn't think he could do it as well as you and he didn't learn anything, you might be a servant on an immature scale. That happens all the time. I know a lady, Carla, she had a single parent mom, and that's hard. She ended up, uh, she had a son named Michael, and Michael was, uh, when he was a young lad, she'd say, clean your room up. Michael didn't clean his room up. What did mom do? Clean the room up for him. And then pretty soon his mess expanded. It started out with a pair of dirty socks in the living room. Pick up your socks! Didn't do it. Mama picked up socks. 
So later on, they always sat together at a table with a meal. Michael would be playing video games. Michael, time for supper! Wouldn't come. So she then became waitress, brought out a TV tray, set it on there. See, that's called enabling. Today, Michael keeps his room clean because he's in the Pennsylvania State Penitentiary. And his new mommy are his prison guards. And he makes that bed every day. And there's not a day that goes by that Carla doesn't wish she could build a time machine, go back and mature her gift instead of using it for enabling. In closing, I went a few minutes over, make, make some meals, deliver them to others. That's a great ministry. Uh, open your home for studies and meals. You might not want to teach a small home group Bible study, but if you are a servant, you understand the value of a good environment. Talk to Roy. Say, Roy, I want to host a small home group Bible study, a six-week session on something, or a five-week, whatever it is, because I want to use my passion to help lead people to Christ. Here's another one. Be the first to assist someone in moving or some undesirable job. Do you have a moving committee? Somebody there who has a future bad back? Start a moving. Hey, listen. Moses and his people lived in U-Hauls for 40 years. It was called a curse. What better way to welcome a family than maybe having a moving committee move their stuff in for them? Will I go to Northside? Will I go over here? Will I go to a community church? No. You move their stuff, you have moved their heart. Be a fix-it person for things in the church. Volunteer as a chaperone or a youth function. We had this guy who was really high in servant, one of our elders. He couldn't resist being a servant. One night, our youth group, the person who was supposed to drive to the youth retreat at Manitani, they ended up, <laughs> they didn't show up. We didn't have a driver, had a, butt, a load full of youth. So I call Bob. Dave, Dave, our youth deacon, he couldn't do it because he had another event to go to. He said, what are we going to do? I said, well, let's just call Bob. He'll do it. I know he will. Bob was 78. Bob always wanted to help. Always wanted to help. So I was pulling a joke with Bob. I said, Bob picked up the phone. Yeah, yeah, what's on? It's 6 o'clock at night. I said, Bob, what are you supposed to be doing right now? He said, oh, I don't know. I said, aren't you driving the youth down for the weekend? Oh, yeah. Hang up. And he hung up the phone. And I didn't get time to talk with him. He showed up with a little bag 15 minutes later and went and spent the whole weekend down at camp. I said, and when he showed up, I said, Bob, Bob, I was joking with you. He said, no, no, it's okay. I want to do it. That's the passion of a servant. Ask leaders for opportunities to serve. Work at a food bank. Uh, sharing responsibilities of the church bulletin directories. Who does the church bulletin? Do you have a church bulletin? Yes. yes. Who does it? Grace. Grace? Where's Grace? Is she here? Grace here? She's not. Does she like doing it? Okay. When she takes the test, don't be surprised if she doesn't come back servant. Because that's a lot of work. It really is. All right, let's go ahead and break here. We have some few minutes. I guess they'll have worship. We'll cover uh, administrative. We'll cover giving.